The main purpose of this lecture is to demonstrate the profundity of pharmacodynamic interactions between the drugs we use to induce and maintain general anaesthesia. However, I first want to cover some exam relevant material. Firstly, there are plenty of drug interactions that have nothing to do with pharmacodynamics. There are pharmaceutic interactions, for example, bicarbonate increases excretion of aspirin after an overdose. There are pharmacokinetic interactions. For example, rifampicin induces the cytochrome P450 enzymes, reducing the duration of effect of many other drugs. But of course, the focus of this series is pharmacodynamics, and so we are concerned with four types of drug interaction. Additive, synergistic, intra-additive, and antagonistic. We represent those interactions in generally three ways. Dose response curves, isobolograms, and response surfaces. Let's start with dose response curves. Note that these curves are often drawn with the y axis having undergone log transformation. You can see that this is a sigmoid curve indicative of that log transformation, however, the y axis is linear. This gives me confidence that Hemmings and Egan are human, since it's one of the only mistakes I can see in their outstanding textbook. Anyway, the types of pharmacodynamic interaction will be reflected in the location of the A plus B curve with respect to the A and the B curves. If the A plus B curve is shifted to the right, the response has been diminished. If the A plus B curve is shifted to the left, then the response has been exaggerated. How much it shifts to the left will depend upon whether the relationship is synergistic or simply additive. I'll try to make this a little clearer using the isobologram on the next slide. If I were to ask the question, what is $1 plus $1? The answer might depend upon the person I ask. A calculator will perform an additive function. I have $1 in one hand, $1 in the other hand, and together they make $2. My accountant will perform a synergistic function. I have $1 in one hand and $1 in the other hand, but by some voodoo magic they combine to produce $3. The taxman, on the other hand, performs an infra-additive function. I have one hard-earned dollar in one hand, one hard-earned dollar in the other hand, but when I put them in the bank, the sum is $1.5. That is, both of those dollars contribute towards an upward bank balance but to a lesser degree than what I had hoped. An antagonistic function would be, for example, getting caught as a drug dealer. I have one clean dollar in one hand and one drug money dollar in the other hand, but not only does the drug money not earn me anything once I get caught, it also results in the clean dollar being confiscated. Note that many sources confuse infra-additive and antagonistic functions even genu uh, generally reputable ones. The response surface, although intimidating at first glance, is nothing more than a combination of the dose response curve and the isobologram. If we were to imagine a 2D graph of effect on the y-axis and dose of drug A on the x-axis, you can see that this rep uh, resembles a sigmoid dose response curve only it is a mirror image. We can do the same with dose of drug B on the x-axis, only the curve is a different kind of mirror image. Any point on the surface between those two extremes can be depicted using an isobologram. Each of those crisscrossing lines is in fact an isobologram itself. The reason they are crisscrossing is that we can represent A with respect to B or B with respect to A. The response surface is particularly used to model synergistic interactions like that between propofol and remifentanil. I want to flesh out one of these terms in particular. The question I would like you to ask yourself at this point is, 
why do we give fentanyl prior to induction with propofol? An anesthesia novice might correctly state that fentanyl is an analgesic, and this is useful during the anaesthetic itself. Somebody who knows a bit more might be able to tell you that if you are inserting an LMA, then fentanyl functions to ablate the airway reflexes, and that if you are paralyzing and intubating the patient, then it serves to reduce the pressor response to laryngoscopy. Each of those things is true, but an important answer that is often omitted is that these drugs have synergistic interactions. We can obtunt airway reflexes and keep a patient still using propofol alone, it's just that we will need to administer a whole lot more of it. Quantitative information regarding drug interactions can be found in the textbook by Hemmings and Egan. The numbers I mention here are taken from that book. With one microgram per kilogram of fentanyl as pre-medication at an appropriate time, the dose of propofol required to induce hypnosis is reduced by 20%. The dose of propofol required to cause immobility is reduced by half. With midazolam, and here I expect the dose is the usual pre-medicant dose of 0.025 mg per kilogram, although that isn't stated, the propofol dose required to induce hypnosis is decreased by 30%. Consider the synergistic interaction that takes place when we administer midazolam, propofol, and a very short-acting opioid like alfentanil. Many of you will have noticed that a patient can be kept unconscious and perfectly still with a tiny dose of each, even during an intensely stimulating event like injection of local anaesthetic into the palm of the hand. The key is in the timing of the doses. Midazolam's time to peak effect is 10 minutes, for propofol and alfentanil is more like one and a half minutes. Synergistic interactions are equally profound with inhalational anaesthetics. Here you can see that in the presence of an analgesic concentration of fentanyl, MAC bar is reduced by a whopping 80% from 4% of sevoflurane down to only 0.8%. These interactions remain a topic of interest for ANSCA examiners. The basic answer to these questions is as follows. Firstly, each of these drugs has favourable kinetic and dynamic properties within their own right, when compared with alternatives. Secondly, these drugs do different things. Propofol is hypnotic, fentanyl is analgesic and reflex suppressant. Thirdly, these drugs have synergistic interactions, and this is what the question is really getting at. This means that we can achieve the conditions we want with a lesser dose of hypnotic. As a result, there is less toxicity and emergence will be faster. You can find more complete answers to those exam questions by following this link and scrolling down to the pharmacodynamics heading. In summary, there are four types of pharmacodynamic drug interactions. We represent those interactions using dose response curves isobolograms and response surfaces. Finally, the interactions between hypnotics and adjuvants are such that substantial dose reductions can occur while still achieving the desired clinical endpoints.